It's a pleasure to have you here. I see uh, George Gomez in the back, who is one of our featured artists a couple of years ago. Uh, thank you, Aaron uh, Roberts, for sharing your beautiful art room with us. And uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Lou Archambault, who we like to uh, think of as uh, one of our own, because he did live on Tamarack Road for a few years when he and his wife lived in Missoula. Uh, Lou was actually instrumental in organizing an art show that was held here in the past, sponsored by Hellgate Lions Club. So he's no stranger to art in Bonner. And we're very excited that he's going to bring his demonstration and um, workshop to us today. So, Luke. <coughs> Welcome. Uh, looking for my notes and they're not here, so I'm gonna wing it. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I'm originally from the East Coast and I came out here for college. Bozeman, graduated in architecture. <laughs> architecture is maybe 20% art, and that's why I was drawn to it, because I was an artist growing up, okay? But I decided to go a path that I knew would make me a living. And I work in, and as it worked out, I went into my art which I always had as a first love, gradually. Is this thing working okay? Okay. <clears throat> so when I came to Helena, I was working here as an architect and heard about Walter. So I went over there and he was my very first teacher. I say that because that has been my art education, has been taking workshops or classes all around the country, wherever I live, uh, from people that are doing what I aspire to. That's how I decide who I want to study under. And almost all of them uh, offer workshops or classes. <clears throat> so, um, with Walter, I'm gonna keep it a little bit short because we're gonna do some painting afterwards. <clears throat> with Walter, um, he gave more than, like I said, 30, art, 30 other people that I've worked with, but he gave more to me and to his students than anyone else that I ever studied under. He was always full of tricks, as I call this talk, tricks with watercolor. I call them tricks, but they're really techniques. And watercolor, more than any other media, requires that you use techniques or tricks because <clears throat> as you all know it's transparent you can't cover over you've got to kind of hit it at first but while it's still wet you can move it move it around and that's one of the important <clears throat> tricks that you I remember him showing me the perfect time to move watercolor paint was he'd get down and he'd look at the sheen of the water that's watercolor is timing and you have to wait for it to get, depending on what you want to do, you have to wait the next step until it's the perfect moisture or wetness. So he'd get down and he'd look at it, and that's told him when to do this next stroke. Okay, it's a good lesson to know about. Is there more chairs? <clears throat> uh, the other thing he did, I don't want to get too technical on you guys, uh, but he taught me uh, the right paper to use. I say the paper is more important than the brushes you use or the paint you use. It's all in the paper and I lost, I bet, four years of trying uh, on my own before I met Walter using inexpensive paper. And that slows you down more than anything. So that's one thing I always encourage you. You go with a name brand, and I use Arches. Arches, it's pronounced, just like my name, Archambault. It's, it's the same thing with the paint. 
or the, pap the paper, arches. A lot of people call it arches. <coughs> and uh, so you start with a, a good paper and the weight of the paper is another thing Walter told me about. It comes in th three different weights, 90 pound, 140, and 300. Walter painted on 300. I went into the class uh, learning on 140, and he, he, sold, he told me, he said, Lou, he says, you're so lucky that you started on 140. I started on 300, I can't go back. It doesn't feel right. So, <clears throat> but 90, I don't think anyone that's serious about watercolor really wants to use. It just buckles too easy. Today, we're actually going to uh, paint on 140 without stretching it. Normally, you have to stretch your watercolor to keep it from buckling. But I found out that it's really not that necessary with the 140, and certainly not with the 300, which is a lot thicker. Now, what about texture? There's a cold press, which is what I use. It's a halfway between a, a heavy texture and a very smooth finish. Cold press is right in the middle. Um, hot press is what they call the real smooth stuff. And rough is the real, just like it says, rough stuff. <laughs> OK. <clears throat> Hmm. Must have left him in the car. I don't know. So that sounds way too technical if, for, for a lot of you guys that, that don't watercolor. Everybody loves watercolor. They, I, I teach now myself, and there's a lot of people that come, oh, I want to learn how to do watercolor. Well, <clears throat> I didn't know it at the time when I was studying with Walter because it was my first and only media. Why did I pick watercolor? It's fast and it's inexpensive as compared with oil or acrylic even. So, um, what was I saying? Oh, because it was fa fast and inexpensive, right? But everyone loves it, that's what I was going to get at, because it's of a certain quality that you see in your watercolor. And it's the transparency that's really happening that doesn't occur in any other media. What happens is the light in this room shines on the paper, goes into the paper, goes through the color hits the white paper and comes back through the color and it glows as a result. And it's that transparency, that glow that everybody just loves. And the other thing about unique about watercolor is you start with a, a light, the lightest colors you, you're going to be using and you build up the darkness, okay? It's just the opposite with everything else, oil paint. Past and pastel, you start with the dark and you work towards the light. So it's, it's unique in that regard. Some people, uh, most people, will pencil in what they're planning to paint and they don't bother letting the, if the pencil shows, which it will, because it's transparent. But that's considered part of the beauty. You can see the artist's thinking when you look at the pencil sketch that's underneath, all of that gets covered up with the opaque medias. Okay. So that's why it's a beautiful paint. Um, I have sense now. I, I worked maybe 20 years just watercolor, okay, starting with Walter. And then I moved into pastel. A friend of mine, an artist friend, Bill Reese, who Bob might know, I don't know. Um, there's two Bobs here that are artists, Bob Neves and Bob, what's your name? Vinny. So, 
uh, he, he saw me trying to do portraiture in watercolor when I first met him. And he said, Lou, he says, do you realize that you're doing, first of all, the hardest subject there is, portraiture, with the hardest media there is, watercolor. He says, I'll tell you what to do. He says, <clears throat> find a, yourself an opaque media and practice with that until you're able to get, say, an eye, right? You can keep changing it, a lip or a mouth. He said, <clears throat> then, when you try to do it in watercolor, it'll be a piece of cake. That made a lot of sense to me. So, what he didn't tell me <laughs> was keep your watercolors going. <clears throat> because after two years of playing around with pastel, is what I chose rather than oil, um, again, less expensive, faster, <laughs> Um, some people hate it, but again, I was just sort of jumping into it, and so I didn't know any different. <clears throat> okay, I said, that was fun. Now I'm ready to do what Bill recommended, and that is do my people in watercolor. <clears throat> it was a total disaster. And I suffered for two years more to get back to the level I was at before. So I tell all my students, <clears throat> don't ever leave your media behind, especially watercolor, because it's so much more timing than anything else, and you lose your timing. The other thing that affects your timing is when you change parts of the country. The humidity level is different. That can throw you off, too. But anyway, I uh, finally persevered and got back to doing people in, in watercolor. And I still, that's still my favorite subject. Uh, over in Helena, I was one of the founding members of a <clears throat> art co-op, not co-op, um, well, a lot of people call them co-ops. It's a gallery that's run by the artists, owned by the artists and run by the artists. We're 14 years old now, right on the walking mall of Helena. And, um, there you'll see a lot of my people in watercolor, but you'll also see my oil paintings and pastel. So I encourage you when you're over in Helena, we're pretty easy to find being on the walking mall called the Upper Missouri Artist Gallery. And in closing, I, I'm going to get on to a demo in a second. <clears throat> but in closing, I wanted to say I also, like I mentioned, teach. I teach watercolor. I teach pastel. I teach combining the two, which is watercolor and pastel together. I didn't bring any of those today. I wanted everything to be strictly watercolor to, in honor of Walter. <clears throat> but I'm going to teach a class here in Bonner in March called How to Draw Anything. You know these books that are out, how to draw dogs, <laughs> how to draw horses. Uh, <laughs> and all that. Well, the class I teach is literally anything because it, it takes you back to its basics. Uh, and part of it is right side of the brain, which you've probably all heard of. And part of it is the perspective, which I learned as an architect. I've combined that, <coughs> or I've taken the parts of it and given them back to artists. So they don't use any measuring tools or straight lines like you do in mechanical perspective. This is just to realize that everything in the world follows certain rules of perspective and you incorporate those into your painting. I'm a little bit anal about straight lines as a result of being an architect, but uh, we don't use straight lines and it, most artists don't want to use straight lines. Um, so it's, it's a fun class, and I can um, give you more detail out there at my booth, which is number 13, I guess, and um, sign you up if you'd like to for this class, which I will limit to 12 people. So <clears throat> with that, I'm going to ask people that would like to try 
your hand, and I will provide uh, materials. I have a little kit I can provide you for six dollars if you're interested in, in purchasing that. Otherwise, we're going to take a break, and then people can sit around and watch the others paint if they want to. Anybody interested in painting? You're going to do that? I'm going to go grab some of my students. So sorry. Some of my students. They want to paint. Okay. So while they're, she's doing that, <clears throat> I'll tell you what I'm going to have here. And it's going to culminate right at the end in a very interesting trick that Walter taught me, <laughs> which I'm not going to tell you about until it's over. <laughs> um, how are we doing on time? That was... Um, you're perfect. Yeah, we've got plenty of time. Okay, about... Minutes. Yeah, because it'll take about that. But you can come and go if you want or just stay here or get up and stretch right now because we're going to... I'm going to squeeze out some watercolor paint. You going to try painting today? Good. Look at this. Come over here. I'll get, I'll get you started. Okay, uh, what we're doing today is a very limited palette. I think I mentioned in my talk that Walter taught me to do that. With watercolor, you can buy maybe 16 different colors out there, but you can mix them into over a thousand different colors. Pastel, there's no mixing, believe it or not. You're not supposed to combine the two. So you've got to have literally 300 different colors of chalk, you know, that's what pastel is, kind of like the old chalk that the teachers used to use. I know they don't use that anymore. But it's soft pastel. There is what they call um, wax pastel. It's, what's the name they call it? Oil crayon. Oil, oil pastel. It's like a crayon, that's what it is. So today, we're also going to limit our colors to two brown brown and blue and I've bought uh, sepia is burnt, burnt I'm sorry burnt, burnt sienna it looks like sepia and ultramarine blue and we're going to paint that subject over there you see that so the first thing you want to do is you change the proportion of your paper that you've got to kind of mimic that proportion. So you see that this is a lot longer and narrower than the piece that you were given. So what I do is I, I draw a border around that has those same proportions or close to it. And then you, and then you put your pencil like, like I did, very simple and very quick. You, you can spend a lot of time, and some people do, they get it very meticulously done. Uh, <clears throat> and that's one technique. I use a uh, minimal amount of sketching because it, it seems to let the watercolor go where it wants to go better than anything else. It doesn't want to, watercolor doesn't want to be controlled. It, it wants to go whatever way it wants. The other thing I'm doing today is, is not stretching the paper. I think I mentioned that. It's, uh, it's, a, it's heavy enough, 140, that it doesn't need it. So what do I do? Usually first is the sky. It's just the way I start. And so you guys can do that too, if, if you have a sketch. <laughs> but if you don't, you catch up to me, okay? And so, even though there's no sky, white, what do you call it, um, there's no blue in that sky, we're going we're gonna to put a little blue in there, uh, just because it, it's a little more interesting. And um, so, you, I wet it first, and then, the trick is to leave it alone, <laughs> but I don't. <laughs> So you can, you can move it and soften the edges a little bit more like clouds. 
might be nice and soft. That's done. That's your sky. Okay. A lot of artists just love to do snow scenes because in watercolor because you just leave the white paper. <laughs> Okay, so I usually start at the top and work my way down. So I'm going to um, do those brush, that brushy stuff. And that says that um, is we want to work in brown. So you see, you see that sky is still a little bit loose, a little bit wet. And that's good because that way these trees... I'm using the size. This is called a square brush. Uh, they come in different sizes. I handed out one inch or three quarter inch brush. It wasn't quite soft enough, so I'm going back and wet it again. So when I put in these trees, they will look softer. Okay. Now some people let the drips just drip right down the paper. There's one artist in particular, he's noted for that, Charles Reed. Uh, and everybody tries to copy it. They actually try to force the grip, drips down. It, it looks so artificial <laughs> when they do that. But we're, we're just going across and then we're going to do some more trees here. Oh, that's nice and wet. It's doing it. It's it's uh, bubbling or going out by itself. It's softening. And usually you have these soft edges in the distance. Because the farther things get, the farther things get, uh, they get lighter and they get softer edged. The closer they get, they get harder edged and darker. So we're going to assume that this is a little bit darker. So we use more paint, less water. Okay. Maybe we'll put a little bit of darkness at the base of those trees there. Just a little bit. You see how watercolor is, is uh, doing its own thing? Just It likes to um, do its own thing. Kleenex or paper towel. And then there's a mountain in the background there which wants to be, oh, I'm going to say brownish blue. So I'm going to combine the two colors together and let's see what I get. Again, watercolor, a lot of times people work flat. Uh, Walter or uh, Charles Reed taught me to work at a 60 degree angle. Uh, Walter worked flat. And so it was hard to see what he was doing <laughs> a lot of times. So a lot of artists, I don't know if Walter had one or not, put this mirror up over their uh, work. And you can see what he's doing. It's really pretty cool. So now we've got a, a basically another color there. It's not blue or it's not brown. It's kind of mixed between the two. Okay, now I'm going to try to limit it to just this one brush because that's all I gave you guys. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to cheat. <laughs> same color, same brush, only just a little bit bigger so everybody can see what we're doing. And I love these shadows that are coming off this, these trees. Let me see, I got to get a little bit darker in here. Okay. Normally I would use a round, but I'm going to I'm just going to use this square brush and do the shadows nice and clean. By the way, the bigger the water container, the better. 
because if you don't change it real often, it'll get muddy on you. And here I'm trying to get a nice clean blue for these shadows. And now we're working right down Now we're going to get a little darker shadow as we get closer in. I'm working on that drop in the snow. By the way, I'm stand and I took this photograph, I was painting. I did a painting right standing on top of the beaver dam. Um, and then I took the picture to go with it if I wanted to change it later, but it's usually best not to change it later. Paint on location and then don't touch it again. Because you'll never simulate the same conditions as far as in your head or anything else. So most artists just really love to paint on location. Did I mention that Walter gave me a really helpful trick about going on location and then turning his back on it and doing the painting. Every once in a while he'd look back at it. Really, it works really well. <laughs> so you use your creativity and you let the watercolor do what it wants to do. Okay. So that was Walter. It's a good trick. We never went outside to paint. It was all kind of controlled in the classroom. But he gave tips for people that wanted to do that. Okay, now we got another snowbank to deal with. This is my palette that I use regularly. I got about 16 colors, maybe a little bit more there, um, which I'm trying not to use today. This is called a Pike's palette, I believe. What's his name? John, his, Pike. John Pike. Very good. Okay. Yeah, that came out a little too bright. Now watercolor does dry uh, lighter when it dries. That's the only one that does that. Acrylics, I think, get even a little darker when they dry. So you got to kind of keep a keep a handy paper towel. Pretty simple one to do because of the, but it's it's harder. You know, I'm, because I'm going fast, I might come up with something nice because I don't have the time to fuss with it. So here I get the uh, grasses, fairly easy. That's what this brush will do for you. Just dragging it. Or you can use it sideways, you know. Use it a whole variety of ways. You notice how it's getting a little bit darker, closer in it gets. If it's still not dark enough, or if you want to improve that effect, you uh, go back and lighten that up a little bit. And then you get this feeling that it's moving forward. Okay. Now we're ready for that big bank, I think.
So it's working. You, you kind of fix, you pick your subject if you're going to limit your palette. And this subject here is kind of a natural for <clears throat> blue and brown. Walter had us doing that too. So he'd give us assignments. And the first assignment he gave us was just paint with two colors. And before he'd let you paint with a full palette. And that was a good lesson. I, I recently took a class on oil painting and they did the same thing. They started us off with one color. And everybody's getting anxious. Nope, oh, two colors the next day. <laughs> Finally, the third day, we could use uh, a full palette. So, I recommend it. Um, I recommend this process of Okay, we're going to let that dry because um, these are hard edges, fairly hard down here in the foreground, you see, and so are these. So what we want to do is just go into that area with, <clears throat> after the, this is dried. But while it's drying, we'll work on that water. It's a little bit brownish blue more than the snowbank. So we'll go back into the... Nope, not blue enough. Now there's a good opportunity here to do the um, to do the sh reflections in the water nice and soft. Let me continue that snowbank a little bit further. Okay. Now. We're going to mix up the darkest dark. And I don't like to use black. I do have Payne's Gray in my palette here. And I do have white. Those are two supposed no-nos <laughs> for watercolor. Walter had them. <laughs> he broke a lot of rules. He said, you know, <clears throat> as long as you know the rule, then you can break it. If you don't know the rule, it's not as good. <laughs> It's pretty sharp. Uh, you can make almost a black if you use alizarin crimson and ultramarine blue, and it's richer than any black you can buy in a tube. So that's what I encourage people to do. And uh, white, you leave the paper, ideally. <laughs> but that takes a lot of planning sometimes. So I'm trying to Work up a dark here without using the alizarin crimson. So let's see what happens. Uh, at this point, some people would say, just flatten out your paper, Lou. <laughs> it's getting away from you. So that's what I'll do. <laughs> yeah. And some people use a hair dryer uh, to speed things up. I didn't bring one. But I'll just... Um, Here's an opportunity to do some interesting textures. They actually sell the brush with a cut on the end of it. And that's for pushing the paint around while it's still wet. Watch, I'll show you.
Okay, push it around the end of the brush. And if you hold it flatter, you can do a stick or something. See? So you can get different widths. They also sell fan brushes, which work out good to do. Um, but what you can do with a square brush is just dry it out and flatten it and push it. And then you can do what they call dry brush. You notice how I'm letting the paint do all the work. I'm not trying to... You just know your media. And we're almost done here. And we're going to just put in this last bit of water here. And we'll put in some ripples because it's so much fun to, to do <laughs> with this tool. Okay, now we're going to let it dry, but first, just to uh, show you, now Walter sort of did this, but he put his, he put his tape down first instead of after the fact, but, and then he'd, then he'd take the tape off and you had a white border. I should have done that, it would have been a lot more impressive than what I'm going to do now. <laughs> which is this. <laughs> or, like Walter said, you always have a mat in your back pocket. If you're out there painting somewhere and somebody comes by, you see them coming, voila, you put, <laughs> <laughs> you put the mat on it and it looks twice as good. And then, of course, if you put a frame on it later, that'd be overdoing it if you brought frames out in the field. <laughs> Then it looks again twice as better as a matted painting, you know. So uh, this is why I would bring this this uh, white tape up. This is called artist tape, by the way. When you take it away, it doesn't rip the paper. It's not like masking tape. And it's not, it's not that expensive. The other thing I learned, not from Walter, but from another artist, is you can uh, change the shape of this painting if you see an area you don't like, you can, you can crop it, you might say. And what he would do, this is Bill Reese I'm talking about now, is uh, he would he'd move this tape back and forth. This is out in the field. And then he'd say, ah, right there, no, no. So he'd put it out here, let's say. But he's got that liberty to do that. So that's how it cleans it up. Now, the biggest trick of all there's a technique, I've used it only a couple times, really. Um, and I'm going to pass some of this out to you guys, too. Okay, time to stop painting, guys. No more. Leave it. Looks. Yeah, you got to stop. You'll appreciate it later. <laughs> Okay, we're even gonna we even gonna let you frame your piece. Yours is already framed. Yours too. This one. Watch this. <laughs> watch this one. Please help it. <laughs> okay. 
So we're going to do what we just did up on stage here. Okay. okay. Now we let it dry. We don't have any hair dryers in here, do we? Oh, okay. But we're going to put this real special stuff. <coughs> no more paint. <laughs> <laughs> You'll understand why in a minute. <laughs> it's important. Take the paint away from you. Or yep, water. I'm moving it. <laughs> okay. There you go. <laughs> you can leave that paint there, though. What? That doesn't make sense. You You'll see what. What? You, you leave the brush there, too. Okay, you two guys use this one, and you two guys use this one. And <laughs> milk of magnesia. <laughs> uh, matte medium. Acrylic matte medium. This was Walter's trick. I didn't question him. You can find this in your art supply stores. I bought some, and then I found some I had hanging around. This stuff's kind of expensive. But it does something very unique. I'm not sure what the other artists do with it. Bob, do you know what they do with it? That medium? Uh, it's a vehicle for acrylic paint. A vehicle? So you can glaze with it and extend color. And, oh. Uh, you put it over paintings like you're, like you're probably going to do now. Uh-huh. Um, to glaze, it's a glazing too. It's, it's a glazing. It's kind of the all-purpose uh, thinner. Okay. When you mix it with your uh, paint, it extends the paint. It doesn't thin it so much as water. Ah. It doesn't dilute it as much. That's good to know. That could come in handy. Oil paint too, or just a coat? No, no. It's, it's water-based. Oh yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, see, I don't work in acrylic, but anyway. Um, I love to do beaver dams. Um, this one's up in northern New Mexico. Uh, pretty high country, just like here, in the high line of Montana. But I worked for the Forest Service as an architect for quite a few years. And uh, they got me down there in New Mexico. Uh, designing buildings and supervising their construction. This is up near Taos, New Mexico. Now, let's see. I think mine is dry enough. So let me show you what I was thinking. You use a cheap brush that you don't care about too much. Although you can rinse it out. I might want to cheat. I might want to use this guy here and rinse it out because <clears throat> um, anyway, I'm going to flatten this out. And the trick is to be fast because it will, like Bob said, it has, it's a water base, so it'll start, <clears throat> it'll start moving your water coat, dissolving it, but not if you're fast. Like, I just put a coat of it on, see, it didn't change it. And that's what we're going to do on your paintings, guys. I'll actually go around and do it to your paintings, because <clears throat> it really needs to be done fast. I'll just look for who's got the driest painting, which I think yours is. Yeah. It dries clear, don't worry. That's okay, it's not gonna hurt us. <laughs> <laughs> it's not signed, you know what it's about. <laughs> this by the way is not allowed in watercolor competitions. They actually say no glazing. 
I call it glazing, but I think there's other terms for it. Um, Oh, just once in a while. In fact, that's a good question. Uh, he had a whole list of tricks. I own a painting of his. I was going to bring it for this class or this day. It's called um, Antique Paintings. It, I don't. I haven't ever seen one in in his displays. Like he had that big show up at uh, the university last year or two years ago. Was it two years ago? And there wasn't any of those. What he used was, um, I don't know if he, he I never did it, uh, I bought one of his, uh, whether he did this first, but he put this crackle glazing on it, it's called crackle, it's actually, it looks like, well you know, some ceramics over time they actually break up, and so he put that on his painting, and then put a wash on top of it and wipe it off kind of like what we're going to do today. And uh, it really looks like it's old, so hundreds of years old and pieces are starting to fall off and everything. <laughs> Pretty cool. <coughs> Any other questions? So I have, uh, so he, he used uh, different techniques for the occasion. Like I remember it was getting real hot up on the third floor of the building we were painting in at the university. So he says, I'm going to treat you all to a really cool waterfall today to cool you off. And that's what he painted really close up, like you could be underneath it, <laughs> standing there. See, it's not quite dry enough, but it'll work, believe me. Yeah, the trick with this is you got to be quick. And it, it, ideally, the paint is dry underneath. <laughs> okay, just let that dry, talk a little bit more. Let's see, what are we going to need? Um, we'll need clean water. Everybody take their glass and throw out the, the dirty into the sink and Fill it up with clean water, okay? Any questions? So you use that medium to seal in your paint. Hmm? You use the medium to seal in your paint. Sealing? Se seal, seal, seal. Seal, that's what we're doing. We're sealing the surface. It'll be impervious to water as soon as this dries. You do that with all your painting? Oh no, this is just this, <laughs> just this technique. Uh, no, usually you put glass on top of them. Uh, and why do they put glass on watercolor and um, what else? Acrylic, I guess. Pastel for sure. It's because <clears throat> the dust in the environment you got your painting on the wall over time, maybe 10 years, if you don't have glass on it, it gets dust on it and you try to take that dust off and it doesn't come off because of the texture of the paper and it dirties your painting and eventually it's just gone, you know. And pastel never dries, it's a, it's a permanently soft and uh, could you, could you fill mine up, throw that dirty one away? Um, <clears throat> So yeah, it's just used, and like I was telling somebody, uh, the, the competitions don't allow it, usually. They, they say you can't do that and be in a watercolor competition. Now if you're in mixed media competitions, you can do anything you want to it, which is what I've been busying myself. After a while, I was, thank you. I was only getting maybe one watercolor out of 10 that I felt you know, it had gotten away from me. So you throw them away and you try again, not necessarily the same subject. Ideally, you take the same thing and you paint it again, it'll come out better. <clears throat> so 
Shabbat. What was I saying? <laughs> hmm? I can't remember. Okay. This is probably as dry as it needs to get. You notice it didn't buckle too much. You know, some people go through this stretching process. And if it does get away from you and buckle too much, you can always mist it on the back with a mister and then put it fat, flat, face down on, with wax paper or butcher paper and then newspaper on the back of it and weight it down and it'll flatten really good. So if you ever have one that gets away from you. Now, <clears throat> what Walter would do is he would just scare the heck out of us. <laughs> you wait and see. Okay. This is why we need <coughs> more water. I'm just going to take um, mostly blue. The blue we have here. And then just do this to it. <laughs> See? And that's, see me, I heard you. <laughs> See, this is what he would do. He'd just freak us all out. <laughs> oh, that beautiful painting! <laughs> what? It's <laughs> really cool, huh? And you got to get it on thick, by the way. Kind of thick. Almost to the point where you can't even see what's underneath it. Uh, yeah, you can just dip into my palette here. <laughs> You're anxious to try it, huh? Yes, I am. All right. I'll let her, because hers is the driest. And so we'll just go into here, mix you up some more. You don't have to be as fast as you were with the other. Okay, don't take too much time. Okay, now we'll move on to you over here. You ready? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Go ahead. You can do it. Ah, what happened to your painting? It's all gone. <laughs> we need uh, some damp rags. Do you have any rags? Little, just little ones. Okay, time to go. Okay. Where's that person go? Oh, someone needed help with her. Or something. Oh, it's that one. <laughs> kids love to do that. <laughs> I hired some kids to do a demolition in my house before the remodel. They just love it! <laughs> Wrecking things. <laughs> it was so fun. Huh? Okay, where's where's this person? I don't know where she is. We'll just, go we'll just do hers for her. Why don't you just do hers for her? Mine? Yeah, you're all done with yours. And get you some more paint. Okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. Good, thanks. Oh, you already got them damp for me. Good. Okay. See if we can rip this in half.
Nope. Okay. Well, you watch me and then I'll give you the rags. Hi, you want to come in? We're just getting ready to make the most exciting move. <laughs> of all things, yeah. Look at these artists, look what they created. Isn't it beautiful? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. This is going to become a night scene. Okay. You won't get it all off because it's it's sort of staining, it sort of stains. And if you don't like it, you can take it all off too. Anyway, that was the awe. Oh no, where did it go? Of course, Walter did this a lot better than I'm doing it, but you get the idea. It gives an overall tint to the piece. And it's not possible to do any other way without a lot of work. And then what you do is you, you put a mat over it again and you see if it looks any better. But let's have you gals get going on yours. Um, here's one rag. <clears throat> okay, and there's another rag here. What? You go first. <laughs> Let mom go first. Well, you kind of paint with it. Kind of paint with the rag. Just don't wash it all off. Just paint with it. He usually did this with a burnt sienna. And it gave a brown glow. I thought I would try this nighttime stuff. It's, it doesn't glow as much as I was hoping. I'm not sure why. This is a first for me, by the way. <laughs> I keep coming, wanting to come back and soften some of the strokes that I'm making. Why was it there? Oh. Keep wanting to play around with it a little bit. And you can play forever, actually. And you can even add more blue back to it. That's pretty much it, guys.
Anyway, any questions? Uh, like I said, uh, I've got this draw anything workshop coming up. Only if I get enough, only if I get the 12 people signed up for it. So here's the details on it if you're interested at all. And uh, you don't have to sign up now. You can send me uh, the cost of it is $110 for two, nine hours of, uh, let's see, six, 12 hours of instruction. And I promise you'll be able to draw anything you want. There's, there's one, I have you draw a famous personality and everybody in your family will recognize who it is. Thank you so much. That was really amazing to watch that. Um, on behalf of Friends of Trovers and Hooked on Art, I'd like to present you with this celebration book of Walter Hook's art. Perhaps you already have a copy. Uh, also, a token of our appreciation, uh, dinner at the Historic River City Grill. Oh! We can go here tonight. Oh, love it, love it, love it. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you.